La libertad está de moda, está tan de moda que aquellos gobiernos que se oponen a la libertad dicen que son liberales. ¿Pero qué significa realmente la libertad? ¿Por qué es importante en la economía y en la política en el mundo? ¿Y cuáles son las principales amenazas que está sufriendo la libertad? Hoy tenemos a dos visitantes muy distinguidos de los Estados Unidos. Brad Lips colabora en Atlas Network desde 1998 y a partir del año 2009 es director ejecutivo de esta red. Tom Palmer es vicepresidente de programas internacionales de Atlas Network y autor de importantes libros de difusión de las ideas liberales, entre ellos La moralidad del capitalismo, lo que tus profesores no te dicen, por qué la libertad, tu vida, tus elecciones, tu futuro y después del estado de bienestar, los políticos robaron tu futuro, tú puedes recuperarlo. Thank you very much, Brad Lips and Tom Palmer, for being uh, here with us. We're going we're gonna to use English. Don't, I'm not going to subject you to, uh, to using Spanish. Absolutely. But let, let, let me tell you, I mean, everyone, every politician today defends freedom or claims to defend uh, freedom. And when we look at public policies, the situation is entirely different. What's happening? Um, well, uh, broadly, I think that those of us who care about uh, liberal ideas need to do a better job at communicating to the, the broad po population why everyone benefits from institutions that protect the sphere of individual liberty and why we should be more attentive to encroachments on, uh, on economic liberties and, and other in interventions in how people live. I think that one of the things that politicians um, are, are very adept at doing is, is championing the interests of the little guy, but then the way that they uh, try to deliver on promises uh, invariably winds up aggregating more power to themselves, often at the expense of, of the, the public they're supposed to be helping. So um, trying to make this, uh, this persuasive case for, for liberty and, uh, and the public policy changes that it entails, uh, that's what um, Atlas Network is trying to support via locally grown uh, civil society organizations uh, all around the world, including the United States, where we come from, including in Mexico. Is, is there a reaction against um, liberty, against freedom? We see, uh, you know, governments like the U.S. government, they support or they claim to support um, liberty and freedom, but they restrict trade. They have uh, new tariffs imposed on various nations. Uh, uh, we have Mexico, in which we have a ruler who claims to be a, a liberal, a classical liberal, uh, but who claims all of the problems of the country are a consequence of neoliberalism. Uh, what's happening? Is, is there a reaction against freedom? Well, I think that there's a contest now. After the end of the Soviet Union, people thought that liberal ideas would be triumphant, and some people were very naive about that. But indeed, the impulse to control other people, I think, is part of the human soul. We'll never be completely free of it. And it's come back in a big way with populism. And populism has this core idea that one politician or one party or one movement is the only representative of the authentic people, and the others are the enemy. We hear this from Donald Trump all the time, mm -hmm. this language, I am your voice, only I can do it, I represent that's what, you. That's what Hugo Chavez used to, used to say in Venezuela, uh, I am the people, that's, he or was I am the state, that's uh, Louis XIV, if yes. I remember correctly. This idea, I think, is extremely corrosive. It speaks to a kind of freedom, which is the freedom of the state to rule the people but not individual freedom. And all social progress, all of the advances of the last hundreds of years have come from individual freedom, the freedom of the individual person. Populism is currently competing with that idea. They claim there's a, an authentic freedom of the, the people as such. And, but the consequence is the individual is sacrificed, mm -hmm. minorities are crushed and exterminated, and most importantly, the rulers who claim to represent the people enrich themselves beyond measure. Look at Maduro, mm -hmm. look at the richest person in Venezuela is the daughter of Hugo Chavez. Mm -hmm. This is the, the pattern everywhere. Those who believe in the dignity of the human person need to stand up for individual liberty, which means real liberalism. I've, I've grown used to the fact that uh, politicians lie, but you know, for a long time we heard that the uh, uh, that the Democratic Republic of Germany was the part of Germany that wasn't uh, democratic, or the Democratic Republic of Korea isn't democratic. Now we use uh, we we hear a lot uh, the the word liberal 
which I assumed came from liberty, uh, used as an excuse to, uh, to, to control liberties, to eliminate liberties. Why are we seeing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that that's one of the interesting sort of semantic questions that we, we wrestle with. The word liberty is or, or liberal has been used in, in different ways in different countries, which I think complicates the, um, the expression. Well, in the United States, it's even, it's even worse. I mean, uh, liberal means exactly the country of what liberal means. <laughs> No, without a doubt, and I think it's it's worth trying to uh, fight for the words that, that best represent what we b believe in. But uh, the, the part of our thinking has been that, uh, that the organizations that we work with in different contexts uh, are going to be able to identify the, the policy priorities that really make a difference in people's lives, and that perhaps the the, the debates over you know the, um, the, the the direction of of liberty in the world are a little bit pie in the sky. What we're really interested in is you know, how do you affect changes that open up the sphere of individual opportunity for, for regular people and can we communicate how those benefits are rooted in these traditions of uh, respecting human dignity and uh, trying to give everyone equality under the law. That these are the fundamentals that need to be conveyed and often that happens in more pragmatic ways and in more practical changes than sort of um, esoteric debates. You mentioned that um, the Soviet Union collapsed and clearly it was a society that wasn't competitive in the world. Uh, but we had all kinds of philosophers like Francis Fukuyama who said, okay, this is the end of history and now it's all paradise and utopia. You said that that doesn't work that way. Uh, what can we expect in the future, especially uh, at a time when these populist ideas are having a resurgence? Well. Uh if they're not checked, we should expect more conflict. This is very important. Real liberalism, which believes in limited government and market exchange and freedom of trade, is the only philosophy that can actually be global because you don't hate other people. You can trade with other people to mutual benefit. You can coexist. But all forms of nationalism and populism are about the enemy. Mm -hmm. They all lead to conflict. So we see populists around the world. They seem to be common. They're populists against liberalism but they all hate each other. Mm -hmm. Every nationalist in Europe hates the next nation. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, if they are successful, we should expect to see terrible consequences like the 1930s. And indeed, Steve Bannon, who was one of the architects of this uh, Trumpismo uh, movement, he said it will be as exciting as the 1930s. Well, from a liberal perspective, the 1930s, 1930s were not... The was the time of the Nazis and the fascists. It was, a, it was <laughs> a terrible time. And the communists. <laughs> and Huge numbers of people were exterminated and murdered in the name of the people or the nation. What we need to do is to promote the only philosophy of peace, and that is liberalism and freedom of trade. That's how people can live together because they see each other as beneficial neighbors. Uh, there was a great uh, German economist in the 19th century, John Prince Smith, he said, if only we could see other people, foreigners, as potential customers, we wouldn't shoot them. Of course. And that is really one of the keys, is to stand firm for free trade. But President Trump claims that uh, what's going to make America great again is if Americans only consume what Americans are producing. And we have exactly the same position with President Lopez Obrador in Mexico. He says that Mexico has to be self-sufficient and only consume what it produces. What's your opinion? That, <laughs> well, you know, whoever, yeah. No, I think it's, it's a virus that is inherent in the, the, the nationalism and the populism that seems ascendant, whether it comes from the, the, the right or, or the left. This idea that, um, uh, that, that self-sufficiency within borders somehow it should be the aim um, without recognizing that, as Tom says, the, if you're really trying to strive for a peaceful and more prosperous world, you need to look at how you not only coexist with your neighbors, but how you operate in a system of, of beneficial mutual exchange. Um, but this is the virus that uh, true liberals need to be confronting. Tell me, if I look at, um, at the uh, figures, historical figures, uh, this is probably the best of times. Uh, poverty is at um, record low levels. Uh, uh, people know how to read and write, which is something they didn't know how to do uh, a few decades ago. Uh, there is more prosperity than ever, and at the same time, we have more attacks and more deception and more uh, reactions against the system that has promoted this uh, prosperity. Why is that, and what can we do about it? 
I think it's a, very, it's a complicated question to explain why this is happening at a time of record prosperity. So let's take the issue of but inequality. You do agree that it's record prosperity? Absolutely. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. And globally, inequality is at the lowest point it's been in all of human history. So even inequality. It's not just poverty that has dropped. But it's also inequality. Well. Mm -hmm. uh, you look about the enormous rise in living standards in so many countries. Uh, the problem is sometimes there's a perception gap mm -hmm. uh, that people expect it to continue on, and they see that they, they don't understand how poor their parents were. I mean, that's just one of the fundamental things. Uh, when I was growing up, we didn't fly in airplanes, we didn't have air conditioning, I certainly didn't have smartphones, all those sort of things. Now people take that for granted, but that's a huge increase in human well-being. Dental care, you can go down the list of things that people take for granted today that their parents or grandparents didn't have. The quality of medical care that even poor people get is often better than that that the multimillionaires could get 30 or 40 years ago because the drugs and the treatments were simply unavailable. So the paradox is, why is it that there's dissatisfaction with the engine of growth? That's what we need to explain, that if you want to be to continue rising in living standards and to see those people who are still poor rise out of poverty, you need trade, you need market economy, and that includes international trade. I do want to thank both of you, Brad Lips, Tom Palmer, for uh, helping us trying to understand freedom in the economy and in politics as well. Thank, thank you. Thank you so, you so much. much. Y a usted, amigo televidente, que hace posible este programa, se lo agradezco también. Esto es todo por hoy, pero no se lo olvide. Nos vemos la próxima. Ante los efectos del cambio climático que se viven en el mundo, es urgente modificar los métodos de producción agropecuaria en México. Algunos de los impactos de estos fenómenos son la precipitación y la presencia de efectos climatológicos extremos como heladas, sequías, huracanes y lluvias. Se requiere mejorar los niveles de educación y las técnicas de las poblaciones rurales, crear e introducir variedades resistentes a la temperatura generar sistemas de alerta temprana sobre la temporabilidad y severidad de las lluvias, fortalecer los sistemas formales e informales de intercambio de semillas, mejorar la infraestructura física, pero sobre todo resolver los problemas de acceso al crédito y a los seguros agrícolas. El campo mexicano está agotado. Ello se refleja en un estancamiento de su productividad, competitividad y rentabilidad. Es vulnerable al estrés hídrico, es decir, a problemas de acceso al agua.